So how do you think the actions of the 1% affect immigrants in this country? In more ways than one. Um, take for instance uh, the war for profit. Um, every immigrant is a suspect because of that. The war on terrorism, we I see it as a war on Islam, pretty much, because uh, you know Timothy McVeigh was a terrorist. Nobody's calling him a terrorist, but you know if some guy named Muhammad just hit somebody else in the face, then you know that's an act of terrorism and whatnot. Um, it's affecting us with the Patriots Act, with all these immigration res resolutions that basically further enlarges the gap between immigrants and non-immigrants or U.S. born. Even if you're a naturalized U.S. citizen, you're still considered somebody who was born abroad. You're still somebody that speaks with an accent and you're alienated because of that. And so the actions of the 1% um, affects the immigrant community probably tenfold as much as it affects um, regular Americans and naturally born Americans. So. Our allies, our U.S. allies around the world Regardless of how much of a dictatorship or dictatorship they run, um, the U.S. still continues to consider them allies, and that affects us as immigrants and affects the, our families back home. Uh, there are basically, like, see what happens in Egypt, for instance. What happened in Egypt is that you know, uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton were reluctant to come out and say this is a dictator and we. You, you should stop because he was a major U.S. ally and he was basically keeping pressure and keeping pressure on Palestine so that, you know, to protect the interests of Israel. And so stuff like that affects us as immigrants. Uh, stuff, uh, things like that. This is just kind of basically not even the tip of the iceberg of what affects us as immigrants from the 1%. Um, okay, so and you're, are you part of the Women's Caucus here? I do not, but I would like to be. I have friends in the Women's Caucus. Um, I would like to be, but I am part of the uh, Free School University and I'm preparing to teach my first class in um, uh, Islam sensitivity. And um, can I'm preparing for about two or three classes. My first one is going to be Islam sensitivity because it seems like a lot of people don't understand what is it that they need to. That just the small cultural difficult differences that will make the world a whole lot easier to live in if we each understood it and respected it. So. Uh -huh. okay. And um, if it's something you're willing, or is it something that you're willing to teach in other communities as well, or you're interested in? If they're interested in, I'll be very happy to. Okay. I'm more than happy. To. If you want to give your information, I can include it with the interview so people. Can um, absolutely. My email address is serene. S e r e n e. Uh, dot heart h e a r t number one at gmail.com. Okay, great. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Sihan, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Hello, I'm doing. Hold on, Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, Hi. Oh. How are the holidays? We're good. You know, I went home with family, but then I came back here at night. And um, everyone was saying like everyone was saying what they were thankful for. And it was really sweet. And I brought my dad to a general assembly. No. He was able to tell my mother that no, I'm not living on the street. <laughs> That's always a good thing. And we're putting back, we're putting together the zine. But yeah, so this is an example of the content. That's so awesome. Um, people writing little like essays. Just like a collection of stuff, like just even this is one criticizing, saying leave. <laughs> this is one with working groups information. Right. It's kind of like a historical time capsule. Right. In different campers, I asked them to just put whatever they wanted to, what message they Would wanted. Would you like me to help? Do you have? I would like to contribute. Okay, it's not too late. Okay. It's not too late. I'm laying it out today, and I want to get it printed today because it's already kind of tonight or today. No, I just want to get it printed because I wanted to get it printed for Black Friday. But I couldn't because there was too much drama here. Right. And this is this is the, the Twitter. Oh. As a young American and someone who is, you know, cares deeply about the past, present, and future of this country, um, I feel that we need to use all that we've learned and all that we've been taught from the lessons of the past to um, create a better future. And I feel right now, um, and the American people particularly have a big problem on their hands because the people no longer hold the power in this government. 
and that's a tragedy because this government was supposed to be based on democracy. And I think that the representative democracy system, as it is, has evolved today, is certainly not serving the needs of us. It's a rigged game to benefit the few and um, squeeze out the majority of the American people who feel that it's, you know, their right to live in a happy, healthy, and secure environment. You know, the greed of the rich is making the rest of us a lot less stable when it comes to jobs. Um, and I think it's, it's because we're leaning too hard on a certain pillar of society. We need to take a more de, de you know, do-it-yourself work ethic and um, really just, you know, take the power back ourselves. We don't, we don't need the blood for this revolution. Um, and I see it as evolution, you know, it's a human, human consciousness recognizing that unless we take care of all of us, we're all going down. So I've traveled to third world countries. I've seen the effects of American policy internationally firsthand. I've seen kids starving because of what Americans have done. So I've seen countries ruined because of what American tax dollars have done. So I'm tired of it and I'm tired of these covert wars being fought for the few. And I think that it's our duty, again, it's our duty to rise up. And I said, I mean, I've heard like people, people have mixed feelings about homeless people at Occupy Boston. I mean, do you feel like homeless people have been well tolerated here? And do you think that it's been a good relationship? I think it's an education for everybody. Um, there are a lot of homeless here that work their butts off in different working groups for things that they have passion for. Um, then there's, you know, of course, the people that just don't go to shelters and do take advantage of what we have to offer. Um, but I think there's um, a lot of give and take on both sides. Do you think that um, people's attitudes have changed on both sides, or what is that? It like, take, how has it progressed? It's gonna take a lot of change and a lot of education for attitudes to completely change, but I think uh, everyone is warming up. Um, I think um, it's not something that can happen overnight. Um, can you speak about this movement as a woman? Do you think that um, women have had strong leadership? Um, I think like every cause, Women have to find their own voice and um, just speak, you know, and, and take leadership roles when they're called for it and be damned what everyone else thinks. I think we still have to deal with um, outside influence and societal um, div division and sexism. Um, it's very hard to get away from. Uh, because we're creating a new and different movement, uh, we're, we're confronting a lot of those issues here, and we're trying to work at it. And again, it's something that doesn't change overnight just because we're a new movement with our voices being heard. I mean, it just, it takes time. What do you Great women, too. What do you expect the, in, in the future of Occupy Boston? Um, well, I hope to stay here through the winter. Um, as a homeless person, I know I have a place to sleep at night. Um, that I've made a lot of new friends and new family. So my hope is that if we can make it through this winter, the movement will grow and people will take us more seriously. Lost a job, found an occupation. Seeing the kid get that one. And he sang like this right after the crash, and he did some songs with Johnny Cash. Maybe 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 it wasn't this thing, but he proved when he tried, he could actually sing.
Then he wrote a simple twist of fate, and once again, his songs were great. He sang about Hurricane for a while, but he was reconvicted in the second trial. And then eventually. Then of course he was born again and his records went to the discount bin. I had to admit I can't really do an impression of Dylan from this period because like most people, I didn't listen to those records. <laughs> He sings like this, and I don't know why, because he's old or he doesn't try. Bob Dylan singing air doing work here more visible but also to create a safe space to support women in camp that were dealing with issues of sexual harassment sometimes um, and in the case of like sexual assaults or these kind of things so there's many different roles uh, one of the main ones has been to actually uh, make the presence of women who are already doing a lot of hard work here like more visible and kind of like act more as a unit and also to stand in solidarity with other some of the other working groups um, that are dealing and trying to bring up issues of, of oppression in camp and outside of camp but just have a more like anti-oppression focused uh, kind of work okay so how is so how do you think life for women is different in the camp than like outside of the camp <laughs> i think um because we're like a small community that a lot of times replicates the same things that happen in larger society. Anything that women deal outside of society, we also have to deal uh, with in here. Um, I also, I think there's a, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, you know, there's like rapes and it's horrendous. And I actually think there's, uh, there's criticisms to be made, but there's also an issue of like, we are not exceptional, we are not different. It's not that things are way worse here is that the same dynamics that we deal with in society happen here. So it's just a way to address it. And in terms of women who are staying in camp and women who are not, I think there is, there is a big difference in terms of if you're staying here, that means you're sleeping here. That means at night when they close South Station, you have to figure out where to go to the bathroom, for example. Uh, you have to walk around alone and you might get harassed from people that are just, this is a very central area, people that are just walking by, that maybe are coming out of bars and are drunk, but also from people uh, in the camp. So it's a huge difference to sleep here or to be just coming during the day where you might have to deal with issues, but you don't have that, that much concern about safety, I think. I work with survivors of domestic violence. Uh, I'm an advocate uh, with an organization uh, in Cambridge. So my connection with Occupy Boston, besides that work, I've been doing uh, a lot of activism in Boston, uh, even before I moved to Boston, uh, on issues of immigration, uh, uh, Palestine solidarity, and a lot of other things. So I'm also originally, I'm Catalan, I'm originally from Barcelona. So I was very excited to see this movement coming in here after I had been following what was going on back at home and in other countries. What do you think are the biggest opportunities for women at, um, in the Occupy movement? I think the biggest opportunity, and I'm speaking uh, from my personal experience, is that sometimes we as women can have an easier time, I think, or have our own oppression to use to relate to other people's oppression. So I think for me, this is my biggest hope, that we can use that to actually work in solidarity and to support other groups that are also, let's say, at the bottom of the oppression pyramid and to help bring those issues up 
and to help make this movement about something more than just uh, straight economic issues and shed some light on all these other intersections. Okay, um, so is is the Women's Caucus working with other groups within Occupy around um, oppressing, uh, oppressive issues or oppression? Yeah, there's actually an anti-oppression uh, working group which a lot of different people who work, uh, who are part of the Women's Caucus, like myself, or the People of Color uh, a working group, or the Houseless Community Working Group. There's a lot of these, uh, we are like a, the anti-oppression group is like an umbrella for all these groups, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way for all of us uh, to get together. There's a lot of relations that happen with specific groups besides that, in terms of supporting, like if we get a lot of donations, for example, uh, to try to support other groups that might not be getting that many to get what they need. So yeah, that's a lot of cooperation. I've been here since the first night. I was interested in occupying DC. I wasn't able to get there, and I found the people here were concentrating on the same goals, things like getting money out of politics, or free, too much Wall Street influence on uh, the Senate, the Congress, and the White House. And there are a lot of other goals. My primary focus has been anti-war or peace work. But the other things all fit in, because if we weren't spending so much abroad, there would be more money here for health care, housing, social services, and education. On most days, there are one or more marches in protest of or in support with. There have been protests of the Federal Reserve Bank and Bank of America and other institutions that have freed people through mortgages and that kind of thing. There have been marches in solidarity with, for example, Oakland. On Monday, there will be one in solidarity with UC Davis. Which Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, the famous Occupy pepper spray Day incident. Leaf and, Cutter! Uh, there are vigils every weekend uh, by the peace movement and marches, anti-war marches. So uh, there's a, a lot of different issues are being covered. Students have been coming out, marching with students to try to get fairer tuition and lowering the tuition fees. And, that has been another big concern. Okay. So, um, so what are, what's your personal hope for this movement? My personal Black hope is that people simply stay here and don't, uh, don't, don't change their mind because of the weather or because the police tend to be cracking down nationally. The idea is to stay until the hands are met and the hands are still being worked out for a very long time. I've lost you. I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> I, I work for elected officials in Massachusetts, and I've been laid off five times and brought back four times. But now I'm out of unemployment, and I have to go on SSI. So I feed the homeless every Saturday, two places, 150 people down the street, and then I come here with, with the food I have left over. Wow, so how long have you been doing this? Uh, for, for uh, the homeless, three years. Okay, and so how did you end up uh, involved with Occupy Boston? Because I, I have the same uh, situations, I believe, about uh, the relative to corporate greed, and I feel that Congress has to do something, but I think the lobbyists are giving them too much money. There's a loophole in the law, which really, ordinarily, would have been corruption being paid off for uh, uh, voting against uh, every uh, piece of legislation that has to do with jobs. I know uh, how you people have been scorned and everything else, but come this spring, I hope and pray that you people will go after Congress, especially the Republicans, and uh, finally uh, uh, strengthen all the laws so corporate greed won't get away. And, and I'd like to see some people arrested. Why should they get away with it? Why should they arrest you and not arrest people in the corporations that have been stealing for years? And Where are you from? This is all cakes, right? All cakes? Right? Okay. Actually, South Boston. Alright, she needs a pin. No, no, she gave it to her. She gave it to her. Keep the bin. Beautiful. Dirty dishes, pass the dirty bin. This is, uh, we, got uh, right now. we got a little more pineapple to serve. Uh, 
I wish Senator Kennedy was still alive because I worked for Senator Kennedy in that as a paid uh, worker right years ago. And he'd have complete yeah, empathy. What to do? Stick people. your finger in the You don't have leadership like that <laughs> in the <laughs> Chip O'Neill. <Yeah, laughs> they have empathy for people like yourself, oh, and they would they yeah. would push legislation. Oh, the Republicans will yeah. shut up, but they want to defeat situation. the president, and I hope to God they don't. I think the president's on your side, well, President Obama, but have to take it's going to take a little while, probably the spring, before uh, you yeah, see uh, that uh, action uh, by him in the, the White House. Day I thought him was with the old time. Um, can, can someone call Liz for my blood? Oh, you need to call Liz. Liz. Oh, no. Liz, Liz. What, and what are you doing today? Why am I here? Um, a lot of things. Like, I mean, I think everyone's kind of like, wow, we need, like, a whole entirely, like, different system. I mean, like, people are tired of, like... At least for me, it's like I'm tired of the fact that like we've had like 10 years of like wars. Um, tired of seeing like public education get destroyed. Like in Boston, they closed like nine public schools last year. Um, fees at UMass have been just continuously rising. Um, like two years ago, they raised fees by $1,500, and last year they raised it by $800. And they're gonna raise it by $800 like again, and the year after that too. And um, yeah, like I think people are tired of the fact that like student debt is like rising. I want to see like an end to student debt. Um, yeah, just a whole lot of different things. Uh -huh. So, um, so it's raining outside and it's really gross. So why are like when it's so like horrible outside and like clearly it's just ridiculously cold and just nasty? Like why are you why are you still here? What motivates you? Um, like I said, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's like a temporary discomfort, but for like the chance of actually, you know, making like our demands heard, or even just like the fact that so many people are like becoming like activists, like at this movement, like it's just really exciting to be around that and to like be part of it and like help this like grow. Mm -hmm. Let's see, like my family, I guess they kind of like somehow heard that I was like involved in the Occupy Boston thing. And I've been just kind of like, oh, like, I don't know, like, my grandmother sent me this email and was like, I hope you won't defy any police officers. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not going to mention <laughs> that I got arrested at Occupy Boston. Um, you know, so I've been just kind of, like, not responsive to those emails as much. Do you think that this kind of action affects, affects your family? Um... I don't know, actually. They live a little far away from, like, they kind of were like, what is this, like, Occupy Boston stuff, like, in the first place, they're kind of like, so I don't know how much, like, effect it has on them. I mean, I hope that it has, like, like I said, like, a lot of professors and students I've seen at school, like, even people who haven't gotten the chance to go down to Occupy Boston, they're all talking about it, and they're all, like, actually, like, talking about politics and, like, what they want, like, the world to be like. So my name is Mattia. I'm with the National Priorities Project. That's an organization that exists just to make federal budget numbers understandable for everybody. And I'm here because I've learned something outrageous that requires all of our action right now, which is that the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest 1% of Americans cost the U.S. Treasury $7.7 .7 million every hour of every day. That's $7.7 .7 million every hour of every day. And why should we care about that number? We have to care about that number because right now the Super Committee is going about its job of reducing federal deficits by trillions of dollars. And if they do that by cutting programs like Medicare or Social Security Disability Insurance, they will have made all of those cuts that are for, for are their programs to benefit the neediest Americans. They will have done that just to, just to pay for, just to finance the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest 1% for the next decade. I have friends 
who benefit from Social Security disability insurance, and I have friends and family members who have all their lives have paid into Social Security and to Medicare. Those are earned benefit programs. Those are programs that they have earned over years of working. And now the super committee is deciding whether to make cuts to those programs just to finance tax cuts for the wealthiest 1%.